it's me again. And yes, I haven't been posting videos as much because instead of working on videos after work, I now exercise after work and like do healthy things as to try to lose weight and get healthier. So it's, it's, it's a very fine line between like, do I want to sit here and focus and continue to sit and work on something, you know, or do I want to, to go exercise and build up a sweat and do farm chores? So I've been doing the latter. I've been focusing more on farm chores Getting stuff done in that regards, I know it's a pain on your guys' end. Uh, there's only 24 hours in a day, right? So, and there's only so much daylight. Uh, so, I don't, I'm not personally a fan of, like, running on a treadmill and there's no gyms around me because I'm out in the country, right? Nobody pays to exercise out here. That's, like, a funny thought. You pay to exercise what? You know, you pay to go lift stuff? You can just go lift other things. I got, you know, me and my husband, we got this bed off this E350. That's a very heavy bed. The metal on it is about half inch thick. It's crazy. We got this heavy bed off this past week with some house jacks and cinder blocks. We would jack it up, put a cinder block on it, and just go around. Well, first we had to cut... It involves cutting the bed off the truck and unbolting it and cutting those welds. There's like four or six welds we had to cut off too. We had to do that. And that was hard. And then you had to go around systematically and jack it up, put a cinder block, go to the next one, jack it up. And it's a dually, right? So you can't just drive it out once it's jacked up because you have the back wheels. So we had to make a bridge to support this heavy bed that came out with cinder blocks. And then we drove it. And then... You put cinder blocks back under and you just systematically go back down. You jack it up a little bit, take out the cinder blocks, and you just systematically go back down. That's what we were doing. And as you can see, this is the result of that. And hopefully I could take some sheep to market soon. I might take some tomorrow. I gotta let them know. Like, hey, are we taking sheep tomorrow to market? Hopefully, the one pickup truck, the Chevy, is kind of toast. But the E350, not E3, I have an E350, the F350 is still good. I don't, people say, oh, get a Ford to get a real truck. I wish I could afford like a 12 valve Dodge Cummins. If somebody wants to do donate one to me, thank you. You know, if somebody wants to donate to me a, a working 12-valve RAM, Cummins RAM, that's great. I hear the 12-valve is a bit better than the 24-valve. I, I need something that can work in tow. But in the meantime, I, I work with what I have. Okay, what's going on in the market today? Well, today's Saturday. Nothing's going on in the market. But this past week was pretty grim overall for the market. People thought that... You know, April, like, things were looking up. Everybody's like, yeah. And then May comes and things go back down. And it was like, boo. So, in terms of MMTLP. And I know I said by June 1st, I see this spin out. And I'm going to apologize. Let me give a formal apology. I'm sorry. I don't think that's going to be the case. And I apologize if anybody had their heart set on June 1st. With the 10 days, it's not likely. Not counting Memorial Day because there's no trading. The last day we would see an S1 filing for June 1st spin out would be May 17th. Or maybe May 18th pre-market. That didn't happen. So I apologize and I'm going to change the date right now from June to July. And I know I'll get a lot of flack for this, but I apologize. And again, if I see new information or something changes, I'm willing to apologize and change. And I'm sorry, you know, wholeheartedly. I know a lot of people are frustrated. I'm also frustrated. I don't see it happening by June 1st because the 10-day trading window. They don't have to. It's OTC, but technically... 
Metamaterials is still under NASDAQ and it's not spun out from Metamaterials yet. So if we see something on Monday, pre-market Monday, with that 10 days, you would see something after hours Monday, June 6th. If we see an S1 Monday pre-market on the 23rd, then June 6th after hours is when you're going to see it. It's, it's 10 trading days, more or less. I know MMTLP is over the counter, but it's not officially spun out yet for meta materials. And if you go by Meta's NASDAQ rules, it has to be 10 trading days. That's when I see the S1. That's what we're waiting on. It could be any time from Monday until whenever. It could be any day, really. I'm hoping it has been filed and SEC is looking at it. We still don't know when there's going to be an investor presentation as far as uh, oil co goes. But on the brighter side of things, there is a tentative interview between me, John Berta, and Smokey. Smokey is going to be more or less the moderator. He's the diplomatic one of us. And thus, he is going to be the moderator. That's going to be, that's penciled in for me tentatively Tuesday, May 24th in the evening. This is going to be pre-recorded. So I have different times I do stuff. I'll do live when I want to have fun or something's like really immediate and I have to show somebody. For example, like when the S1 comes out and it says, you know, this is the new ex-dividend date. This is the new record date. Come that day of record date or close to it, I'll start going live. And then you can just watch me and follow along. And that's like a live situation where I'm just going to stream what I'm doing and you follow along with me, whether you're playing along or you just want somebody to listen to, keep your company, whatever your motive is, that's what I'll do. It's just easier than doing like a post recap video that's kind of like too late at that point. But in this instance... It's going to be pre-recorded, one, then there's no distraction from any live stream. Two, we can focus on the questions at hand. And three, I can post-edit it to make it seem a bit more polished and easier to follow. It can be less here and there convoluted and more down to the facts. I submitted about 20 questions in all to John Berta. I'm not too sure which one he's going to answer. So we'll see come time at the interview. Again, this is between me, myself, and Smokey. Smokey's the moderator. I used him as the diplomat in this case. I thought it would be a good intermediary because he's very diplomatic. And it'd be good to use his skills as an intermediary between me and John Berta. I'm a very enthusiastic person. I'm like Terry in terms of my enthusiasm. We're very enthusiastic people, me and Terry. And I dress a bit more eccentrically. <laughs> And that can intimidate a lot of people. Believe it or not, in real life, I have quite a bit of people when they meet me. They're very intimidated. I think because I make eye contact and I give a firm handshake. And a lot of people get intimidated by me. Maybe it's the confidence. Maybe it's algamum of all those things combined. So if you use a diplomat, it seems to work better for me. I know if I'm with my husband, people just, like, talk to him and assume we have telepathy and we're thinking the same thoughts. And if you talk to him by proxy, you're talking to me. That's a personal, like, I guess pet peeve of mine. But I do realize that a lot of situations involve a, a diplomat and people like to go through a diplomat. Once we do the interview, I'll edit it and I'll try and get it out the next day. Let's talk about CEI. CEI had a big week this week. It was big. They are now caught up on filings through 2020 and 2021. So CEI had a big week. They had lots of filings come out. They had the 2020 10K come out. They had the 2021 Q1, Q2, Q3, and the 2021 10K. They had one, two, three, four, five filings come out this week. What's left is 2022. Same with Viking. What's left is 2022. So good job, CEI. We're now compliant. 
As a result, uh, the stock went up in the morning after all the other filings were released. However, it did come back down. One, because probably a lot of these options were expiring. A lot of options were expiring Friday for Meta as well. The stock didn't break 190. If it did, it wasn't for very long. And CEI, yeah, the options were expiring, so it didn't it didn't break, you know, more than eighty something cents. Then it went back down to the seventy to the seventy cent range. Next week could be better. Now that we're compliant, a lot of the FUD about CEI not being compliant is kind of obsolete. It's obsolete FUD at this point as they've caught up on their filings. More or less, it wasn't, it was, they were caught up in their filings. They were waiting for the SEC to do their own audit of the 110K. And they finally proved it, and then, boom, they could submit all the other filings. So, great job, CEI. I look forward to a big run-up soon. Next, what we're going to look for is the 2022Q1, as well as this S4. And an S4 document is going to be with Viking Energy with CEI. And that's going to tell us that, hey, we're going to merge. They've already filed the 8K some time ago for that. For the merger between CEI and Viking, they filed the 8K. And now we're looking for that S4 to come out sometime soon. Doris says he's taking the offense now. They were playing defense for a while. Now they're taking the offense. I really like CEI a lot. It's a very broad spectrum energy company. You have the oil and gas aspect. Their oil and gas is more or less Louisiana light. That's where they have their oil and gas set up. Meanwhile, oil and gas stocks keep going up. This happened during the 2008 recession, actually. A lot of the other stocks went down as the housing market crashed. But the oil and gas stocks went up. Natural gas still continues to remain high. This is because of the embargoes against Russian natural gas and oil. As a result, Europe is looking for alternative pathways, one of them being the United States, who already has nat liquid natural gas facilities, such as in Corpus Christi and Louisiana where they take all that natural gas and they chill it really cool so it liquefies and then they're able to ship it overseas and a thousand cubic feet of natural gas over here is eight bucks we think that's okay a bit of editing here i'm going to put in the chart gas in europe has gone crazy this past month uh the price that i gave in this video was still too low so look at this chart what is eight bucks for a thousand cubic feet in America because of the alternative pathways is now 80 to 120 in Europe and the UK. That's a lot of a price difference for Europe and the UK. And I feel bad for them coming this winter. So it's worth a company to do that retail arbitrage to get it from over here, turn it into the liquid and then ship it out overseas to Europe for a much higher profit. In other news, let's talk about Colgate Energy. I've talked about Colgate Energy twice on this channel. One was their acquisition of New Mexico property that was similar to the Oro Grande. It was largely underdeveloped as an oil and gas play. And then they had a couple smaller Texas plays. The second one was where they were thinking about going public, but then a company approached them for a buyout, an acquisition. And at the time, it was over $5 billion, which was really, really good. Well, Colgate did do a deal, but it was with Centennial Energy. The combined companies will have a value of $7 billion dollars, Colgate is $3.9 billion, which is very good. I would have never considered Colgate to be in the billion range. 
back when I first did their acquisitions of New Mexico assets. But now they're in the $3.9 billion range. Consider this. Colgate Energy had less than, had about 92,000 acres combined. They had 92,000 acres combined approximately. And they're getting $3.6 billion. I know it's based on oil and net acreage, right? It's based on oil and net acreage, at least my methodology. So Colgate might have had 96,000 acres, but I'll go with 92. Also, Colgate was a private company. They were thinking about going public, but they were merged for stock in Centennial Energy. And it was three, evaluated at $3.9 billion dollars. They had about 92,000 acres. I know it's not price per acre, it's price per barrel, but I'm not quite sure how much they had total. I did a rough estimate on their New Mexico property back when they acquired it, but I'm not sure about their other properties because they were private at the time. So it's very hard to get like information on private companies, what they have in their reserves. And again, if it's underdeveloped and they're not saying anything, that's very hard. So it's, you know, it can be hard to get a hold of Howard Ham from Continental, how much he has really reserve-wise. But if you do the math, that is around $42,000 an acre. And a lot of that New Mexico is like Torchlight or Grande was underdeveloped. That's $42,000 an acre. All right. If you transpose that... And use the similar, you know, evaluation more or less for the Oro Grande. I'm not saying it's it's exact. This is just rough, you know, a rough guess. And I know their New Mexico didn't have too much oil and gas asset on it. You can go back and look at my Colgate Energy video. But that's a very, very good price for that property, for that asset. They're not buying the property, of course. They're buying the rights to the to the oil and gas but that's a very good price for all their assets 42,000 an acre if you use that same methodology on torchlight that's 5.6 billion dollars as we're talking about 3.2 billion barrels of oil and trillions of cubic feet of natural gas so that would be you know a very very good deal for the or grande in terms of the buyer what does 5.6 billion dollars get us though if we had a 5.628 billion dollar how much would our dividend be dividend wise that's about 20 bucks that's based on 66.5 percent oil and gas rights for torchlight minus the 10 percent holdback dividend Divided by $165 million outstanding shares. And that $5.6 billion sale price becomes a $20 dividend. Again, I'm pretty certain Colgate had less reserves than the Or Grande does. As I've done and then a rough analysis on their biggest asset, which was in New Mexico. But kudos to you, Colgate. If you read this article, it talks about it. That it was done with Centennial and it was a stock transaction deal. Now, Colgate is a private company. Or was. So, the fact that they're getting stock in Centennial. All the owners, all the equity stakeholders. That's what you call an owner in a private company, an equity stakeholder. Get now equivalent shares. So, let's say you own 3% of Colgate. No relation to the toothpaste, by the way. So let's say you own 3% in Colgate. Now you own 3% of $3.9 billion is what you now own. The company was valued at $3.9 billion of stock in Centennial. So now if you own 3% of Colgate, you own 3% of $3.9 billion, which still is a lot of dollars. That's a lot of dollars. That's dollars I'd like to have. Certainly make things easier. Uh, and then I'd have more time for YouTube videos. That's just a rough translation. If, you know, given by the Colgate. I know it's not per acreage. That's why I said this is very rough and this would be a very low price. But if you went by that particular price, 
that would translate to about a $20 dividend for you per share. I'd also like to add that Colgate had quite a bit of debt to pay off. They had like $1.4 billion of debt, according to this article, which was paid off in the deal. Ora Grande has basically zero debt. Torchlight had zero debt getting, getting out of this, which is great. They paid off their debt in February of 2021 because I was there. I was there when they paid off the debt. So they paid off their debts. We don't have to worry about debt affecting our dividend. Going forward this week, I'm looking forward to CEI. If information gets dropped and MMTLP get, goes running, we have that. Okay, guys, that's it for today. I will see you soon. Goodbye.